to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright, The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment. You are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch, a prison for your mind. And that prison is called The Matrix. Ooh. Bloody compelling movie, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Maybe for good reason, because it could be a good metaphor of, uh, of what we're living through today. So, when Neil was in that prison, there was no way to explain to Neil what the Matrix ultimately was, right? The only way he could get the whole picture was for Morpheus, the great man, to come and say, hey, you got to see it for yourself. And he, of course, that famous scene, he offered two pills. That's it. He offered the red pill or the blue pill. You can take the blue pill, and that's where you go back to the dream world. You go back to the prison, you don't even know you're in a prison. Or you take the red pill and break the shroud of delusion. And of course, it wouldn't be a movie if he took the blue, so he took the red. We all think we're red pillars. <laughs> Probably by the end of this episode, you'll be convinced you're a blue pillar. There's a movie called The Red Pill, which is very different to this. Um, but uh, that was a few years ago. People might have forgotten about that, thankfully. What was it? Was it an adult movie? <laughs> no, like... no, no. <laughs> well, it's a pretty stark choice, Ash Joe. Uh, put yourself in Neo's shoes, right? A life of delusion and bondage or a life of insight and freedom. It's so dramatic. You'd think like a Hollywood movie exactly where something like mm. this belongs, right? Problem was when that movie came out, uh, there was a couple of people around the world who were like, man, this is pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> this is, and he says... That what those, is this documentary? Yeah, that's <laughs> what right. I was saying. <laughs> and those people were Western Buddhists. They were people who didn't grow up Buddhists uh, but had in, later in life opted in. They'd, they'd actively chosen to take this path or you could say they'd chosen to take the red pill. So, the directors of this movie were really interesting cats. They were uh, something brothers. What were they? Can you Google it? Uh, Wachowski. The Wachowski And brothers. they're actually the Wachowski siblings. I'll correct you on that. Gotcha. Okay. I got no idea. Um, <laughs> but they gave Keanu three books in his preparation for Neo and one of them was actually The Moral Animal, which is uh, about evolutionary psychology and also a book by uh, Robert Wright. So, <laughs> Mate, I saw it. I've got to pull him up on this. I saw the video that he's referring to and Big Keanu, he didn't specifically mention his book. He just said a book on evolutionary psychology. Maybe maybe there was another interview where he specifically mentioned The Moral Animal, but the, the author's claiming that his book was the one that they showed him about evolutionary psychology. I'd say so. I'd say. I'd, <laughs> well, if it was, Keanu forgot the title of it. Oh, so it mustn't have left that much of an Mustn't impression. have had a big impression on him. But the point is, right, some of our happiest moments come from delusion in life, uh, having the blue pill. For example, when you're a kid, believe in the tooth fairy, it's going to pay a visit. That's, mm. that's a pretty good delusion. It is a good delusion. Get that's a bit of money out of it. Um, but they can also produce pretty bad moments. Uh, and sometimes these bad moments in retrospect are obviously delusional and they're like horrible nightmares, but it's a delusion. You're in, you're in bondage, Ashton. You're in bondage. Yeah, that's right. It's like these delusions could be like lying awake at night with a sense of anxiety or feeling hopeless, feeling depressed for the end of days, feeling bursts of hatred towards people, bursts that may actually be good for the moment, but they corrode your character, feeling a burst of hatred towards yourself, feeling greedy. All these delusions pop in. Yeah, you can't help but having a few couple of mini red pill doses, right? Like when you're lying in bed that night and you really, if you really have a think about it, no one really gives a shit that <laughs> the thing that you're worrying about in the context of the actual universe, it's big time. You tell it's a delusion. Man, this is that was actually a couple of nights ago. I had I was lying in bed thinking that I had developed flu symptoms, and I was just thinking, oh, I can't go to this friend's birthday party on Saturday night, and then I can't do this other thing. I can't go to this meeting. Woke up feeling fine. Yeah. It's just a weird delusion. It's all a big Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I'll think about uh, a food example. So when I was going through the notes here, I show you were talking. Got an example here when you have schnitz. As soon as I saw the word schnitz, I was like, I'm having schnitz for lunch today. It's the best food in the world. Mate, it's horrendous. But junk food is a big delusion. Mate, I used to be a massive fan of schnitz, but now I feel like it's not as good as it used to be. I feel like the good taste when it hits is getting less good, but even still, then I've got four hours of pain afterwards where I just can't operate just because it's, it's, I don't know, it just sits in the gut and it makes you feel so shit. But there is a delusion that you, that you think junk food tastes delicious and it, it, it's a really good thing to do. Yeah, and you're probably going to go back again. Oh, yeah. I'll uh, convince you to go in a couple of hours if we wanted to. Definitely. Because this is how subtle the delusions can be. So, there's no point in finishing, you know, going out and getting a six-pack of Krispy Kremes and smacking them down. But, you know, you're going to probably go back to it again. And uh, these <laughs> sort of right. delusions add up to very large-scale warping of realities. You know, food just being one example of a very large-scale reality that actually occurs in your life. That's right. And junk food is a good example of delusion because it uh, really highlights some of the Buddha's teachings. 
the dynamic of being powerfully drawn towards sensory pleasure that winds up being fleeting at best. That sensory pleasure, that enjoyment of schnitz in my brain for two hours before feels like it's going to be awesome, but then for four hours after, I realized that was a bad idea. Yeah, schnitz is one, <laughs> six pack of donuts is another, but of course, uh, sexual encounters. Mm -hmm. Um, status enhancing promotion, getting that promotion, you're back on it, your online purchase. Um, the thrill is there, gives you a big thrill, it fades, and you probably might realize it's fades and hey, that was just a silly (laughs) thing. But then at the end of the day, you're just wanting more again. That's right. As the Rolling Stones would say, I can't get no satisfaction. And according to Buddhism, the human condition, you know, the famous uh, Buddha assertion of dukkha or suffering, you know, unsatisfactoriness. Yeah. Some deep stuff by the Rolling Stones there. They were all over it. <laughs> so, what exactly is the illusory part of donuts, sex, goods, the, the promotion? Um, so, for now, let's focus on one illusion common to all these things. And if you think about every single time before you rock up to Schnitz, mm. that hour before it, every single time or the promotion, if you get the promotion finally, you are guaranteed to overestimate how much happiness these things are actually going to bring into your life. <laughs> and that's right because uh, this delusion, it's so subtle that even straight after when you realize that the promotion didn't bring you as much happiness as you thought, if you were told that the next promotion won't give you eternal bliss, you probably wouldn't be that surprised. But on the other hand, we'd go for it anyway. We'd pursue it at the very least because we think, you know what, maybe it is. Maybe it is going to bring me more happiness. So, we do have this unbalanced view of the future. Uh, we spend more time envisioning the perks that the promotion and the food's going to bring rather than envisioning the actual headaches it's going to bring. So, it's not a balanced view of reality. Now, as we said, Robert Wright did the evolutionary psychology book before this. So, he was saying that... And for a long time, man, if you look at all of his books, he's like 30 years, absolute heavy hitter in terms of evolution and evolutionary psychology. Oh, definitely. So, he says, you know, as a bit of a thought experiment, if you were to think of yourself as a designer, if you were designing a... Uh, an organism or a, or a species, you know, put yourself in God's shoes and say how you're going to design a human, then there's a few things that you would put into that design just as a given to make it as good as possible. Mm, so, like, you know, the goal of natural selection, right? You're trying to uh, pass on genes to get mm. to the next generation. So, um, there's probably going to be three principles. Firstly, achieving a goal like the ones we've mentioned, we've rattled off a bunch of examples by now. Uh, achieving them, you need them to give you pleasure. Let's give Mm. that organism pleasure since animals are going to keep uh, pursuing things that bring pleasure. So, if you think about the goals like having sex, going to pass on genes, eating is going to pass on genes, schnitz, impressing (laughs) impressing peers, uh, increasing your resources to get more things. Um, All these things are going to help spread the genes. So, we want these things that are gene spreaders are going to pump endorphins into the brain. Yeah, that's it. We want all those things to be pleasurable. That's the first principle. But then the second principle is that that pleasure that we get, it shouldn't last forever. You know, after all, if you just did it once and you got pleasure from it once and that pleasure lasted for the rest of your life, you're not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. So, if you want a species to do this repeatedly, you know, you don't want the first meal to also be the last meal. You want to be having a bit of pleasure, but then the pleasure fades. Now, afterwards, the third principle is pretty interesting because it's where like the a delusion that sort of makes sense. So, firstly, after you've had the pleasure, the brain should focus on the pleasure that reached the accompanying goal mm. and uh, not so much on the fact that the pleasure is going to subside and it was all a bit of a blue pill moment. Yeah, that's right. You don't want to be ambivalent. Um, you don't want to realize that oh, I'm going to get this pleasure, but it's not going to last and you're not going to do it. So, you need the brain to just focus only on the pleasure that comes with the goal and not with just the, the lack of pleasure that comes afterwards. That's it. So, you, if, uh, you oh, we just designed the perfect species. We did. And this is exactly <laughs> us. us. <laughs> us. Mate, the amount of times we've read about hedonic adaptation, it's exactly this. We are getting us to that 50,000 foot level. Uh, we can view it from the top down and we think how silly the whole thing is. Mm. We know it more than anyone, <laughs> logically. But, you know, I still got my third Sonos uh, last week. I've got two. One was enough. <laughs> one, one does the trick. But then I need to... Two? Two's a bit better than one. And I don't know about three. <laughs> like, there's diminishing returns, surely. But you can't help it, mate. <laughs> you can't help it. This is just the way the human brain works. It, it, it seeks it. It mm. gets it. You get the pleasure. Yeah. And then logically, it was just... It was a pointless endeavor the whole time, pretty much. Mm. Um, but you're not going to... Uh, you're going to forget about the the right thing just so you pursue it all again and you're back on the treddy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, with Buddha's insight, uh, at the end of the day, we can actually begin to see the absurdity of it all and that is sort of the goal of this book. Yeah, as uh, Yonge Mingyur Rinpoche, the meditation teacher in the Tibetan tradition, he says, ultimate happiness comes down to choosing the discomfort of being aware of your mental afflictions and the discomfort 
of being ruled by them. So basically, we're choosing discomfort either way, but it's an important decision that we need to make. If you want to liberate yourself from the parts of the mind that are keeping you from realizing happiness, then first you need to become aware of them, which is going to be pretty unpleasant in the short term. So now we are metaphorically speaking, living in the matrix right now as we speak. And however mundane mindfulness meditation may sound, um, it is a practice that if pursued rigorously, you're having a moment right now where we'll put our hands up and say we're being Morpheus um, <laughs> and we're actually offering the red pill right now and pursuing this, this 21st century Buddhism, you might be able to have the opportunity just to see how deep the rabbit hole goes. The real life matrix that we're living in, that we're actually embedded in, it can kind of come to see more like the one in the movie, not maybe quite so mind bending, maybe you can't be dodging bullets in that sense, but maybe we can see this sort of deceiving and uh, oppressive nature of it all, something that we need to try to escape. But the good news is, if you want to escape the matrix, as uh, he says, why Buddhism is true, Buddhist practices and philosophy can give you a little bit of hope. As Morpheus says to Neo, I can only show you the door but you're the one who has to walk through it. The Buddha ran into a bloke named Aggie Vesana and big Aggie said, you know what? I want to debate you, Buddha. You think you're fucking top shit. You think you know everything. And so Aggie said, you know what? I have found the self. You're saying it's not a thing. You know what? I found it. Got it. And check, mate. You'd think here. So Aggie says, look, form is myself. Feeling is myself. Perception is myself. Mental formation is myself. Consciousness is myself. Checkmate. And he's obviously doing a blatant provocation of Buddha. Yeah, but the Buddha, you know, remained calm as he normally would. He says, very well then, Agivasana, I will cross-question you on this matter. Would a consecrated noble warrior king wield the power in his own domain to execute those who deserved execution, to find those who deserve to be fined, and to banish those who deserve to be banished? And Agi says, yes, Master Gautama, he would wield it and he would deserve to wield it. Now, here's the kicker for the Buddha. He uh, was playing a bit of a now I've got you the son of a bitch um, <laughs> game, back to the games people playbook. Um, he says, then, what do you think then when you say form is myself? And he's like, oh, do you wield power over that? Then Aggie was sweating a little bit and he said, no, master. Uh, he doesn't have complete power over his body. And he said, Aggie, what about your feelings? Do you wield complete power over them? And Aggie was mm. like, ooh, done for that. And perception. <laughs> And all the things that Aggie thought he had control and power over, it turns out he has no control and power over uh, like the noble warrior king who could have the power over his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, the Buddha, he made his point, a pretty famous point. He says that you, as in the you that experiences feelings and perceptions and entertains thoughts, isn't really in complete control of things. Yeah, you're feeling those things, but you're not choosing to feel them. They're just popping along and you're just going along for the ride. So, what the Buddha was getting at is the, the delusion that we've got that somewhere inside our head, we believe there's some kind of supreme ruler like the king of a kingdom or a chief executive. And then if that's the case, where exactly are you going to find this thing? And if, if there is something there like that, you're probably going to find it. And 2,500 years later, uh, the science of psychology is catching up to the Buddha mm. and it's sort of proving his story to be pretty bang on. Yeah, the Buddha was pretty onto it two and a half millennia ago and now psychologists are catching up today they found that you know what yeah even though they probably don't call it the king of the kingdom executing those who deserve to be executed but they were saying you know mate you're not the president or the ceo or the prime minister or whatever that there is some kind of uh unanimous agreement among all psychologists that uh the conscious self is not some all-powerful uh executive authority yeah so if you think about your conscious mind you don't really have full control over yourself Mm. do you whatsoever Mm. so you get a question is that uh if that isn't control then what the hell is in control where's adam (laughs) i thought adam was in control (laughs) mate adam is taking a back seat you got this adam this ceo um rocking the making the calls in their head but when you start looking into that you realize that hey there's actually nothing in particular in control of your mind Mm. Uh, the closer you look at it it turns out there's a lot of different players. Mm. Uh, another guy who's um, big into his Buddhism, he does come up in his book, is Yuval Noah Harari, who does speak in a similar vein of this in 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, where uh, the movie, uh, what was the movie? I don't know. Where's this going? <laughs> the one where you got the little lady and she's got all the emotions in the brain. Oh, yeah. yeah. Inside Out. Inside Out, yeah. yeah. So, it's Inside Out, he says, is like... We're talking the, the documentary of The Matrix, but the inside out is probably the closest thing to, to reality of actually what's mm. going in your head. With that little kid, it doesn't have a CEO. It's actually got all these these 
emotions around in this show. Mm. That's right. There's all these different uh, emotions that are vying for control. And it's just the one that's the strongest at any point in time. It's the one who's got their, their hands on the steering wheel at that point in time that's driving you. Now, there's a lot of paradoxes in uh, Buddhism. And uh, here's the first one here. And there is a jungle in your brain. And in a sense, you're not the king of the jungle. But the paradox is that if you realize that you're not the king of the jungle, you can start moving towards <laughs> something that's like the king of the jungle. <laughs> that's which right. makes sense, right? Like I think if, um, say if you are going through all these emotions, when you start meditating on it and you take a step back, it's only then you can actually mm. start controlling your fear or whatever emotion might be running in the show at that moment. That's right. We feel like we're the king. We want to be the king. We want to be in charge of our own behavior. But if you realize that you're not the king, then you can take a step towards being the king. So again, let's look at this from a evolutionary point of view. So what are the Darwinian benefits of this self-delusion? It seems like a not a good thing to be deluded. Like, why would mm. wouldn't natural selection be uh, favor the people who are who are blue pill, understand they're in chains and sort of got freedom? Uh, turns out it's not the case. Yeah, you'd think that you'd be you'd want to follow the leader who knows what they're doing. If somebody says, "Oh, I don't really know why I got up this morning. I don't really know where I'm going. I don't really know why I do all this stuff for reasons that don't make sense." That's actually a red pill response. <laughs> yeah, ironically. Yeah, I'm realizing running. I actually I'm not in control. Yeah, I got up and there's this emotion that told me to go bing bong bing, and I'm actually like a ping pong machine just flying around everywhere. <laughs> it's a red pill. It's a red pill response. Yeah, it seems like a, a strange one, but in short, I guess from natural selection's point of view, it's good for you to tell yourself a coherent story. It's good for natural selection for you to be the blue pill just to say, you know, I'm some kind of rational, self-aware actor and you think that you're in control. It makes sense because you kind of, you know, you're heading the way that you want to head and then you're going to mm-hmm. do the things that propagate your genes. Well, if you're going to war, you want to be in the trenches with the person who says, I know where I'm going and we're going to defeat that enemy compared Follow to the me. person who goes, oh, I'm just jumping around to <laughs> different emotions. So, all told, we're under at least two kinds of illusions here and one of them uh, is about the nature of consciousness itself, which we see as we're more in control of things than we actually are. The other illusion is about exactly what kind of person we are. We believe that we're capable Mm. and upstanding. We might call these two the illusion about ourselves and the illusion about our selves. (laughs) Selves. <laughs> I don't know that I could on, on paper when there's a space between the two, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, I like it. Well, it's uh, the illusion I think about ourself is the illusion of the CEO. The closest thing is an analogy we've got to who we are. We're more like a public relations person mm. in your head, right? Because mm. the, the, something pops up in the brain and then you're the public relations person is speaking out to the world as if they've got everything under control. <laughs> And that public relations person doesn't have any control. Right? That's right. They don't have any power, but they can kind of find a way to tell a coherent story. They're kind of justifying all these things are going on and they're trying to manage expectations. So, it's possible to argue that the primary evolution function of the self is to be the organ of impression management. If the conscious self isn't a CEO directing all the behavior, and but it thinks it's directing, well, how does our behavior actually get directed. Yeah, the, the public relations is just speaking externally, but what's actually mm. internally driving things to move forward? And, uh, psychologists have landed on something like the, the Buddhists again, which has been true for a long time, as, as says the title. But the answer is that the mind is modular. Your mind is composed of specialized modules. I think the inside out is a good metaphor, actually. Yeah, it's like a bit of a dog-eat-dog world going on inside your brain. There's all these different systems, all these different emotions. They're all competing to make it to the surface, to win the prize of conscious recognition of being the thing that is acted out in the real world. And your brain is just consisted of all these little modules just all flying mm. around trying to trying to get to the top. Yeah, so inside out, it's probably it does break down a little bit here, but rather than just having emotions <laughs> in the brain, is actually mod. Think of the brain as different modules popping in, and these modules are fighting like it's the wild, wild west uh, to to beat each other. And the one that actually wins is the module that actually gets installed into your brain, and that's what you sort of uh, move forward with. So one module everyone's got is intertemporal utility function. That's just one one module that's that's kicking around inside the brain. It's the equation which describes your willingness to delay gratification. You know, your willingness to forgo something you like right now in order to have more of that thing later. So you know, someone you might be willing to give up a hundred bucks now. You invest that uh, for the hope that you get you know one hundred and twenty bucks in two years or something like that. But somebody with a different uh, intertemporal utility function that's calibrated a bit differently, they're saying, well, if I'm going to give up 100 bucks now, I actually need 150 bucks later. So different people have different time g- discounting going on in their brain, but everybody's got this time discounting, what do you call it? Intertemporal utility function module. So this function that we've got, I'm not going to say it, 
<laughs> that function you were just saying beautifully there, it is impacted differently by the different modules that actually might be uh, installed into the brain. And that's something thing that you might think is objective is influenced significantly. So for example, if you've got a bunch of blokes uh, in the room and some hot women walk in there and say if they're heterosexual and they find them attractive, in terms of their intertemporal uh, utility function, the rate at which they uh, discount in the future, that's going to change because we've got a new module kicking in saying, hey, we want to forego the cash in the long term and we want to invest our cash in the short term here to impress these women because that module, which has been uh, installed by evolution, is going to lead to more gene spreading. There was actually a study that they did where they just uh, they showed heterosexual blokes pictures of good-looking women and it actually worked. It actually changed the rate at which people discounted in the future and they, it changed the amount of risk and reward that they wanted to take on, which is an interesting thing to think about. How could just you know normally rational, uh, financially aware people change their stance just by looking at, a, at different pictures? So the module here is mate acquisition mode which has a lot of evolutionary value and it's quite fluid. So uh, you think, for example, uh, career aspirations, going to change time to time, but moment to moment, you're not going to have much change. But mm. what they had was one study that blokes fill out their uh, career plans and some filled it with just a whole bunch of other blokes in the room and some filled it in when there was other women in the room. And uh, it turned out that when there was women in the room, they actually were more inclined to rate the accumulation of wealth as the mm. most important goal as when it was just blokes in the room. So, you know, that mate acquisition mode, you wouldn't think is running the show or your conscious CEO will be making the call, but actually of all the different modules in the brain, women pop in, <laughs> mate, acqu- mate acquisition mode, arm wrestles another module, pulls it down, kicks it on the ground and gets installed into the brain and then that brain kicks in this new module to, to get moving. <laughs> that, that, does that work? Yeah, no, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. As you say, like... I- from time to, over a number of years, yeah, your goals probably change, but from one day to the next, they shouldn't change. But you can kind of hijack the brain by just putting attractive women around you. And then suddenly, as you said, that mate attraction module kicks in, starts winning. And then all of a sudden, blokes just want to make a hell of a lot more money because they think that's going to impress women and get them a mate. That's it. So there's all sorts of new modules that might come into change. And it does respond a lot to feelings and emotions. So you watch a movie that's scary, like The Shining, makes you feel much more fearful. And the self-protection module might kick in and you're going to be in a different different state. Or uh, the movie Before Sunrise, it activates feelings of romance. So if you're going to have a someone over and for a first or second date, bit of Netflix and chill, you're chucking on Before Sunrise, right? You want mm. their um, their mate acquisition mode to be installed rather than the fearful mode. Oh, but I guess the fearful <laughs> mode, yeah, it says protect me. Yeah. So that works. <laughs> or what does CL, CL Dini cover this as well, right? Did he? I well, think, yeah. well, in um, persuasion, it's like uh, just little things like mm. you change the the music in the background, mm. and it totally changes um, mm. the the module that's installed and makes people more uh, likely to buy it. So, from a marketing point of view, mm. psychology point of view, and a Buddhist point of view, it's all pointing yeah. the same direction. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and that's good. When all those big fields are all kind of saying the same thing, then they're probably onto something. So, let's look a bit closer at uh, one module in particular. Now, jealousy. It's pretty mm. pretty dumb pretty bad sort of module isn't it it's a bit of a tyrant in the mind but the emotion of sexual jealousy constitutes an organized mode of operation specifically designed to deploy different programs um, governing each psychological mechanism so that each is poised to deal with the exposed infidelity that's a bit of a mouthful that line (laughs) but the actual feeling of jealousy it is got an evolutionary purpose Mm. when that module takes in it's going to give you pre-programmed sort of actions, won't it? That's right. All these things, once the feeling of jealousy takes over and becomes the uh, the one pushing all the buttons in your brain, then all these different things pop up. And you're not the CEO. The uh, It seems like at the moment, jealousy is the CEO. Things like the goal of deterring, injuring, or maybe murdering the rival, maybe the goal of punishing or deserting your mate, maybe the desire to make yourself more competitively attractive so that you can beat out the rival. Maybe the, the memory kicks in and reanalyzes different things that happened in the past, that different doubts pop up, different questions pop up, and probably just a general estimate of the reliability and trustworthiness of the opposite sex probably takes a hit as well. Oof. And then the shame programs um, kick in as well. Mm. So, yeah, Jesus, there's a lot going on there. And you think you're the one running it, but again, it's just a it's a pretty just natural human being response that um, we all have. And I think some people, you know, you might think you're above something like jealousy, but 
if Chelsea, Chelsea is definitely somewhere in the brain, it could kick in and start. Mm. Well, as the first one thing, yeah, I'm injuring or murdering the rival might happen and you're in jail all of a sudden. I'm guessing the people who were in jail for murder never thought they'd be in jail for murder. Yeah, that's right. They're just a different module kicked in. Now, he says we've got, there's a few key modules here and he says that there are really seven main missions. There's self-protection, there's mate attraction, mate retention, there's affiliation as in being part of a group, there's kin care, there's social status, and there's disease avoidance. These are kind of the main modules that are battling it out and uh, generally taking control at different points in time. Yeah, it can be a bit messy trying to um, fit things into little categories like something as complex as the brain, but I think it's a pretty good seven there. Mm. Things wrestling and all the emotions and actions Mm. underlay that. So, you're probably broken up into these seven different parts. But at the end of the day, you're not the CEO. You're probably these seven different modules, not even beings um, Mm. that kick in and you're like a little robot that bounces around and does different actions in response to this. Life, as we kind of are living it uh, without thinking too much, it's a bit of an illusion. You can't be truly free until you pierce the illusion, look into the the true sort of heart of things. Until you can see it for yourself, as Morpheus said to Neo, you're going to remain in bondage. You're going to remain in that prison. Now, there's a couple of differences between this metaphor that we've been running this episode between the Matrix and, and Buddhism. Firstly, Matrix is pretty easy to describe. Like you've got a pretty clear picture of what's happening. You, <laughs> you can see robot overlords with gooey pods. You don't want to be in those gooey pods and pumping dreams into their brains and that's not very complicated compared to the complication that there's no CEO or there's no self that actually exists in the brain. Yeah, in the Matrix, there was the evil overlords that you could rebel against, whereas in this Buddhist Matrix version, there's no real you know, oppressive enemy holding you back. It's just the things that are going on inside your brain. There's no clear enemy. It's just all happening. Yeah, it helps when a movie makes some sort of villain yeah, and then you've definitely. got sort of like a path a as, easy, a, yeah. Yeah, as a hero's <laughs> journey. But there is good news. If we are to think of it and just make it up, like there, there is a villain just for good purposes, meditation would be the rebellion against the oppressive overlord. So if you are trying to whack those um, those chains and stuff that are in that gooey pods, the way out of it, it's a pretty um, gross scene actually when it gets out of it. <laughs> Very disgusting. Yeah. Probably similar to maybe meditation when you start <laughs> realizing um, when you get red-pilled. Uh, yeah, you, you pull yourself out of it through that insight. So that's it. There's all these things are flying around in our brain and until meditation, you don't really know what's going on. But if you can start to meditate, that's when you can start to see all these different things pop up and realizing that you're not in control is the first step towards getting a little bit more control. Mm -hmm.